keyboardist Tony Banks from Genesis heard King Crimson and decided his band had to have one if they were going to follow suit. I hate the word progressive music really, but it was the idea of progressive music was really to try and not stick with the boundaries that had been set by pop music up to that point. And the Mellotron gave you a sound tool that hadn't been heard before and it gave you that orchestral feel. But I think it was on Foxtrot where it really became a big thing and it opened the whole album with uh, Watch of the Skies. It was a kind of sound that people had never heard before. And they'd come to a Genesis concert and you'd start off with this over-the-top dry ice and Pete had this sort of UV makeup on and UV lights and this fantastic sound, you know. And I, it was just like you were not at anybody else's concert. This was Genesis. Although he made great use of his Mark II model on the early Genesis albums, he soon grew weary of it. It wasn't designed to go on the road. It was designed to go into somebody's living room. And we were rebuilding it every night. I mean, it had sort of vacuum cleaner motors and bicycle chains in there. It was a very Heath Robinson affair. It just could produce this wonderful sound. And, and there was no other way of doing it at the time. There was no other form of sampling or anything. And you had to have it, but it was just... It was a horror thing, really, in a way. And, and some nights it was just, you, I was just so swearing at the thing, and, and it was awful. And if I wasn't swearing at it, someone else was, because, you know, it was out of tune. That was the other thing, you had to keep tuning it, and it was sort of going on and down. And, and then some days it was just, goes, Ooh, and the, I've got tapes of, you know, when we're doing Watch of the Skies Live, and you start off and you go, Ooh, and you think, what's gone wrong tonight? We had Tony Banks's M400 from the Seconds Out Tour come into us. Martin Smith. And it was an abortion. It had been held together with sealing wax. It was just dreadful. And no wonder Tony Banks turned his back on the Mellotron. He was having a bad experience. But the people who had them maintained, they loved them. People that didn't have them maintained, like Rick Wayne and didn't have his machines maintained, hated them. But whatever they say about it, they hated them then, they love them now. Because there is nothing that sounds like it. Which is this love-hate relationship, I suppose, really. And you had to treat her kind, you know, sort of stroke it, coax it. You couldn't fight it. Most musicians who've used the Mellotron have a story about the unpredictability of playing it, particularly live on stage. The thing is, what's great about it is that they're reusing them, aren't they? I mean, people are using the old things. And the other thing that's quite funny is a lot of these sampling instruments, they've sampled the old Mellotrons to produce that sound. And, you know, I mean, quite proudly, some people come up and say, hey, look, there's the old Mellotron sounds, do you want to use them? And I, and I play them, and I think, yes, it sounds just as shitty as it always did, you know? You had to do so much to it to make it sound good. Rough edges are a very important part of music, and I think the problem is, as everything gets more sort of slicker and sophisticated, you can make everything sound so perfect. But, you know, the charm of so much, particularly when you talk about guitars and things, I mean, the, the distortion and the way it's not quite right is what makes it sound so good. And in terms of keyboards, I suppose Mellotron is one of the best examples of an instrument that doesn't sound quite right, but therefore has character. Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, Tony Banks won't be buying a new Mellotron himself, but there are plenty who will be, as Streetly say they can't produce enough to cope with the demand.